我坐在某的内房，听我来唱。我坐在某的城街头。sempre alla stessa data Monte Amore e sa barca per pomar solo amore Except it's supposed to be up here It's supposed to be up, you know, way up there Thank you for that So when he sang it, it was really the way it was supposed to be But thank you very much for guys If you knew a lot about opera, you'd know how incredibly bad I really am Thank you Thank you very much Oh, really? All right. So I, I, I do good, I give good phony, yeah. phony <laughs> um, All right, next question. Another question. And how is it that I'm so much better looking in person than I am on TV? <laughs> Thank you for asking. I think no one asked that question. I asked that question. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> Renegades. Star Trek Renegades is going to be a an online movie. The, the hope is it's, it's being treated like a pilot for an online Star Trek series. Now, how can we do that when CBS and Paramount own the rights to Star Trek? What a great question. <laughs> the reason is you can make something and not benefit from it financially. You can't charge anything for it. So we had a Kickstarter campaign and we raised some money off of the, the, the names of the actors that committed to it. And you're allowed to make something that violates Paramount's uh, copyright as long as you don't benefit from it financially. So it will be given up free on online. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the, the dream is that if CBS goes, this is not bad, that they will give us permission to do an online uh, series, and then they will, then there'll be money ge generated from, you know, uh, we call it, uh, either, either, either it'll be charged for it, one CBS says, here's how much we want, and you'll get to keep this money, or it'll just be an ad-supported platform where you still watch the shows for free, but, but, but you're annoyed every 10 seconds from that, <laughs> which is the way the internet is, right? It's like, you know, when you use Twitter or anything now, you just get annoyed to death where they try to make money from your free thing that you have. A budget. We have a budget. We, we, we're shooting. The show is shooting in two days already. Um, I originally had a much larger part, I'll tell you honestly. I, I, um, I love to work on stage, and I got cast. After I originally agreed to do Renegades, we were supposed to shoot it last spring, and they needed a bigger budget, so they did a second Kickstarter campaign. So I had committed to shoot it in whatever that was, April or something. And then when they postponed it to October, I said October is a very busy month for me. Um, I'll do my best. Well, what happened was that I had a, I developed a conflict, so I, my part has been shrunken down. And do you know Sean Young, the actress uh, Sean Young? Mm -hmm. Yes, they've created, uh, they've basically taken my part and divided it between the two of us. They've made two characters, it's hard to explain, but it's very cool what they've done. And the really good news is I get to kiss Sean Young. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a smaller part, but I do get to kiss Sean Young, which I think is probably a, a Makes, I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it really does anything for you guys, but it's going to be cool for me. Um, say again? 
Holograms uh, can actually, they actually kiss better than anybody else. <laughs> I say that uh, because I know, and you don't have to believe me, but frankly, you probably won't find out because if, if you do find out, then uh, that would mean something terribly inappropriate happened. <laughs> <laughs> Like a I'm going to give this guy a mic because he's my new co-host. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do so you have a, um, uh, do you have another question? Um, I did answer Renegades. Oh, uh, let me just finish. Renegades is basically a rogue Star Trek. It's like all of the characters have kind of, you know how Tom Paris had a bad rap in the beginning of Voyager? He kind of had to redeem himself. But this, this is the theme of redemption, of something having gone wrong for each of these characters. They've each either been accused of something they didn't do or they were involved in something that went wrong. Um, but they all have kind of a chip on their shoulders. Uh, and, and they're all banded together. So they do these things that Starfleet needs them to do that is aware of, but they kind of do it in their own unorthodox way. So it's sort of a kind of a black ops kind of version of Star Trek. It's a very cool... Sorry? Uh, I'm not at liberty to answer. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, you know, I I, uh, I could answer that question because it does come up in the pilot, but I'm gonna I just want to leave you with a little bit of excitement. I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, Tim Russ is directing. Walter Kane's in it. Uh, Tim is also in, on camera as well. I'm in it. Adrian Wilkinson. Do you know Adrian Wilkinson from? Um, yeah, from exactly. Uh, she she is in it playing uh, a female captain. She's terrific. Uh, and they're. Um, Oh God, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed. I don't remember. There's a lot of really good actors from other aspects of science fiction other than Star Trek. So I hope you'll have a look at it. Tim is a very good director. Well, are you still playing the uh, Voyager Doctor, or are you one of the play minor doctors? Oh, I am. That's a very good question. I agreed to play. I, I did not want to play the Doctor. I wanted to play the programmer, Louis Zimmerman. I thought it made more sense. Okay, yeah. I thought it made more sense because the Doctor hasn't aged, and he still looks younger and trimmer <laughs> right now. So I wanted to leave you with that blur, unless they wanted to digitally correct me frame by frame, <laughs> which they do with a lot of actors now. I just didn't, I, I didn't want to touch the legacy of the, of the Doctor's character, but it makes complete sense that Louis Zimmerman is still uh, working and programming and doing other projects, right? So, um, so that, was my, uh, that was my decision. I hope you don't mind. Um, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, right there. Sir. Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm sorry. wondering, what was your most favorite episode and what was your least favorite episode? Okay. Um, I can tell, I'll do my least favorite first. I feel bad because uh, obviously one of our wonderful writers read this one. I just thought it was the silliest one we did. It was called uh, Twisted. Twisted, I think, is the episode where all of the space inside Voyager was jumbled up. So for 43 minutes, we would come through a door, and instead of being in, in engineering, we were in, in uh, we were in the mess hall. So this is what we did for 43 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that 43 minutes of exciting science fiction? <laughs> I mean, yes, it would be creepy. It would definitely be creepy if you're home in your house and all of the in internal space had been re redone, reconfigured, to use a Star Trek term. That would be really annoying to get up and go into the kitchen to make some coffee and suddenly you were in your basement. Like, Sorry, Grandma. Right, but, but it's, still, it's, it's not, I wouldn't call that high drama. <laughs> but anyway, so that was the, the one, and we had a scene, we, uh, we had a, poor, a female director named Nancy Malone, who I felt, no, it wasn't Nancy Malone, it was another female director. I felt really bad for her because we misbehaved terribly. Because we all, we all thought it was a silly show. We had a scene in Tom Paris's holographic, uh, bar, Sandrine's bar, which is our, we had a scene where we're all sitting around a table and we had we each had one line and it was one of those awful shots where the camera just happens to pass by you when you say your one line. We're all sitting around the table and so somebody says, I'm sorry about the scene, I don't remember this kind of, I don't know about it. You know, the camera just moves over their faces and we were so punch drunk and tired that we couldn't get it right. So we would get seven people would get their line right and the eighth person messed it up. And we would get nine people who got it right and the tenth person messed it up. I mean, it just went over and over and finally the director gave up the shot and we did it in cuts because nobody could get their one line right because we were busy goofing around. So that was a, I remember that night as being one of the nights where we really, uh, where I really felt that we were not fair to the poor director. 
Um, she killed herself after that. No. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, I just fell over. Um, I thought the, the table was closer. Here, let me lean this way. Um, and then my favorite, I have a few favorites depending on the style. I, I mean, uh, Timeless is one of my, the hundredth episode where Voyager crashes in the ice planet and Harry Kim changes history. I thought was a really great one. Uh, yes, it's similar, but, but it's not really, if you saw the plot, it's not different, but you're right, as far as going rogue, if the going rogue theme, you know, in order, in order to do the greater good, we act like bad guys. Yes, it does have that in common with Renegades. I, I, I always thought Timeless reminded me of Titanic, you know, <laughs> because you, when you watch the movie Titanic, you just keep wishing that you could just change, you could just change it, and go back and not have the iceberg there, or not have the, you know, um, <coughs> But uh, I thought that was a particularly great one for the whole cast, especially for Gareth. Um, as far as Doctor-centric episodes, I uh, uh, dramatically I love one called um, Latent Image, where the doc it's uh, it, Joe Manoski, our writer, described it as the birth of the Doctor's soul. Um, if you were, it was a Sophie's Choice situation where the Doctor had to choose between saving a young female ensign and Harry Kim, and because he knows Harry Kim better, he saved Harry Kim's life. It's one of those, oh, yeah. I can't save them both, I had to make a choice. And then he can't reconcile his feelings of guilt at having let his personal emotion influence his decision. And, and in fact, by saving his friend, he, he could not do no harm to the other, he, it, 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 it obligated him to let her go and, and saving one. So that um, conflict within his program that he had violated in, in, in strictest uh, terms, he violated um, the Hippocratic Oath, which is sort of the doctor's prime directive, right? Um, led him to have kind of a, a nervous breakdown or an emotional breakdown. It was the, the conflict in his program led him to, to keep thinking circularly around his decision and reliving the moment, reliving the moment of decision over and over again. And they can't, and he can't do anything anymore, so they have to sort of shut him down and reboot him. Do you remember that? Um, that was a cool one, I thought. Um, it, it, um, you know, nothing, Star Trek invented recycling. <laughs> yes, I did. Long before we were picking up aluminum cans, Star Trek was reusing plot lines. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that that is a very good dramatic episode. Then I have a very uh, my favorite romantic episode is someone to watch over me, where the sort of my fair lady episode where the doctor is teaching Seven how to behave on a date. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love I love that one. That's a great one. And and then um, my. I think uh, my favorite uh, sort of out and out comic one is Tinker Tenor Doctor Spy, which which, is, which begins with the doctor singing Madonna Mobile, the one where the doctor is trying to have a fantasy life. He tries he tries to program himself to have daydreams, and then he can't tell the difference between his daydreams and his real life. And, yeah. <laughs> exactly, the emergency command hologram. I remember when Brandon Braga. Uh, asked me, he said, well, what would some of the doctor's um, fantasies be? And I said, sketching seven and nine in the nude. <laughs> I said it so fast that clearly I had thought of it before. <laughs> so, of course, they put it in the show. <laughs> I should have said something else. I should have said, well, never mind, but I should have said. There <laughs> are children in the room. Um, That's how they got it. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, well, I already asked you, so I have to come back to you. Who well, asked? Did I ask you a question? Oh, all right, yes, sir. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm in a classic B movie called The Howling from 1980 or 81. I don't remember, 80 or 81. 81. It's over 30 years ago, so it's 32 years ago. It's when I met Joe Dante, I play... Uh, I play a character named Eddie Quist, who happens to be a werewolf. It's sort of like a Charles Manson kind of killer, uh, who is, uh, and, and what I loved about the script, John Sayles, 
went on to be a very famous uh, filmmaker, uh, wrote the, the adaptation of the, of the book, Put the Howling was based on a, on a horror novel. Um, and uh, it, what was cool about the script is that werewolves were treated like, uh, almost like they had to be in a self-help group, like they were in Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that. <laughs> if, if you had this special ability, there was a guy uh, played by Patrick McNee who was trying to keep you, teach you how to keep your impulses under control. So he was a sort of weird cult leader. Uh, it was a very cool uh, old movie. It stands up. It really does. But what was extraordinary about it was that it had uh, some practical makeup effects, meaning not computer generated. This is before computer generated imagery. It had practical makeup effects that had never been seen before. Um, Rob Bottin, who was I think 20 or 21 years old, who had been the protege of Rick Baker, they were working on competing movies with similar technologies at the same time. Rick Baker's was an American Werewolf in London, um, uh, which starred David Naughton, and mine uh, that Rob did, uh, the makeup on me, was called The Howling. And what it involved was using little air bladders. They would, first of all, they cast my face in alginate, which is what dentists use to cast to make a, a mold of your teeth. So they kind of put this stuff on, make a mold of your own face. Then they sculpt your face. Then they make a thin mask that exactly looks like your face but fits over your own face. As if you had a thin latex mask that joined under your jaw, inside your lip, and, and right under your eyes. And this, this mask of you fits right over your face. Then between your own skin and the mask, they would put little air bladders, little tiny balloons that looked sort of like <laughs> But they assured me they were not. <laughs> and these little, these little balloons would be tied, uh, glued to your face. And they had little air hoses that came out the back. Then they'd put a copy of your face over the balloon. So they had a balloon here, 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 a big one on my neck, and then and then all the hoses came out the back, but then I had a long-haired wig, kind of like The Walking Dead. You know, I had this long, straggly wig that covered up all the hoses, and I literally had like eight or ten young kids, 18 to 20, off camera with little hoses in their mouth, puffing air into my face. <laughs> so during the transformation, my face starts to percolate, and no one had ever seen anything like this before. How did you get a person's face to suddenly start looking like a pot of chili boiling? And then after the initial bubbling, then he made actual puppet heads of my face, where, which had a mechanical framework that poked out the muzzle of the werewolf. So all of, at the beginning of the transformation is really me, and then it transitions into these puppet heads. If you've never seen it, go home tonight. Go on YouTube and, say, and search Robert Picardo in The Howling and you will see this transformation. It's pretty cool. darn cool. And when you think it's 32 years old, it's very cool. Yeah. So yeah, so I am a 